we got Brian Forrester back, and today we're going to talk about megalithic structures. How are you doing, Brian? Good, thank you. How about you? I'm doing swell, actually. I know we had some uh, some technical problems last time with the audio, but we finally got that resolved, so now we can finally talk about megalithic structures. Sounds good. Sounds good. So let me ask you then, in your research, in in you know your decades of research on this subject, what were some of the most profound structures that you've discovered in terms of these like megalithic structures? And can you kind of just preface that with what it is for the audience that aren't familiar with what megalithic structures are? Well, megalithic just basically means very large stones. So what we're looking at are constructions of. Um, walls and temples and other buildings that are constructed of stones that weigh in the tons and are not adhered together with any kind of mortar, concrete, or other kind of um, cement-like material. It's stone-on-stone -stone contact. And so what are some of the most, um, you know, in your opinion, what are some of the most profound megalithic structures that you've come across or discovered or researched? Well, the most profound ones, I would say, are in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, and Lebanon. And why Why in those specific countries? What were so profound about those compared to some of the other ones? Uh, it's more sense of scale. Uh, in Egypt, of course, you have the Great Pyramid as one example, where you have 2.3 million um, blocks that make up the Great Pyramid, each one weighing in the tons sometimes as much as 80 tons. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's a very profound construction. That is kind of amazing. What do you think, or who do you think built these structures? I mean, 80 tons is something that we can, at best, maybe attempt nowadays, but not to the exactness and, and perfection that they did back then. Who do you think built those structures? Well, the important thing to state is that uh, the constructions were not done by uh, the people that most archeologists believe. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the dynastic Egyptians did not construct the Great Pyramid. Uh, the Inca in Peru did not construct the megalithic structures there. And in Lebanon, where you have Baalbek, which is um, a massive thing, uh, it said that the Romans did that, but the Romans didn't. The Romans built on top of a much older, more profound construction. Right. I tend to agree with that, too. You know, when I went uh, in my in my personal experience, when I went to uh, Egypt some years back and I saw and I spoke with Stephen Myler about this and I saw the pyramids in Egypt, specifically the the Cheops pyramid or what they call the Cheops pyramid, then my first intuitive instinct was there's absolutely no way that human beings or modern human beings the way we are today or even thousands of years ago constructed this just my off the bat intuitive instinct said that and it pretty much confirms with what you're saying but that still leaves the million dollar question then who exactly built these structures and i guess we can go into why later but then who who built these structures actually well, an alternative theory for Egypt is that there was a culture that was much more sophisticated technologically called the Chemicians, who existed 12,000 plus years ago, and uh, that they were the ones responsible for the three large pyramids on the Giza Plateau, as well as the tunnel system there, and other structures that we find underground in Egypt. But they were the victims of a massive global cataclysm about 11,700 years ago, which wiped them out and all of the other great cultures from the distant past. And were those were those beings more related to the Nephilim, or were they more related to us, or a different species that doesn't exist at all anymore? Well, the Nephilim are believed to have existed much, much later than that. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at, at Baalbek in Lebanon, that's very close to Mount Hermon, which is where the Nephilim descended uh, from the heavens. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I think that uh, the basic uh, huge construction of Baalbek was done by what we call the Nephilim. Right. And so this structure, then, what do you put like, let's say Baalbek in Lebanon, for example, where do you place that structure in terms of, or its development in terms of date-wise? Do you think it's like 10,000, 100,000 years back? How old would you say that one is? Well, 
you know, the problem is that the Bible isn't too specific in terms of time. Right, right. right. Uh, but, but I would, I would, yeah, I would believe that they are at least 5,000 years old, um, if not contemporary with the constructions of those in Egypt, because we see some, some great similarities between the, te- the techniques that were used in Egypt and those at Baalbek. Right. Right. It is it is very identical in terms of not like you mentioned using limited mortar or no mortar at all and basically just stones upon stones. Why though? Why do you think some of these structures were like I have Stonehenge right now it just actually went off in the background but I had Stonehenge in there. So Stonehenge kind of falls into the classic megalithic structure research, right? Why Yeah, do it does. Um uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Why, why, why did they develop that, or what purpose did it serve? I mean, we've all heard opinions about astrological, um, basically like a time keep or some kind of like a reference to astrology or astronomy. What do you think like a structure like that, let's say specifically Stonehenge, was used for? Well, the idea that it was used for astronomical alignments is kind of obvious, but there's no reason why you would have to drag huge stones from Wales in order to, you know, set up markers to set the uh, solstices and equinoxes. So clearly there's something more profound involved. What do you think that is? I think it involves uh, acoustics and resonance. I think uh, the stone was selected specifically for its uh, acoustic and resonance properties and could have set up some kind of... um, some kind of energy field that allowed the participants who were in that area to instantaneously get into into an alternate higher state of consciousness. So you think that's a lot of those structures basically just acted as instruments to amplify or dictate or maneuver sound. Is that is that what you think it is? Well, and higher levels of consciousness. I think there were accesses from. I think that was the more profound purpose. Right. And that's why. That's. That's why the stone had to be very specific type, um, and these people would go as, as far as needed in order to, to gather stone that had those properties. Right. Now, what were the stones generally, or typically, what type of stones did they use for these? Was there, what, did it really matter what time, or was it specifically, or excuse me, what type, or was it generally granite, or were there like a variety that they would use? What kind of stones did they usually use? Uh, in general, it was stone that was quite high in quartz crystal content. Okay. So granite, uh, granite obviously, and then in Peru you also have a, a stone called andesite, as well as ba- basalt, which is quite high in quartz but also high in iron content. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, those are the stones that would be used for the actual activation of the energy. In the case of something like the Great Pyramid, uh, it was the the internal spaces, which were granite, that were used for the activation and vibrational properties, whereas the vast majority of the pyramid itself is made of limestone, mm-hmm. which is more of an insulator. Insulator. Now, well, what I wanted to ask is, why did they use the, the quartz properties or the crystal quartz properties? Because there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of new evidence kind of coming to surface about the, the properties of crystal quartz and why they're so significant in terms of keeping record, keeping energy, being, you know, uh, sound vibrational amplifiers. But what is it about the crystal lattice that really makes it, gives it those properties? Have you ever done any research into that specifically? Well, it's because it's what's called piezoelectric, and that means that under pressure it, it creates energy. And so that's what you're, you know, that's what the watch is working on. That's what this computer right. is working on, etc. So it's interesting. So the pressure, basically, when you project sound waves through these crystals, well, we'll say sound waves, into these crystals, did that pressure variation actually creates energy. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it, it amplifies it. Amplifies. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So that's kind of, so that is really the basis of why they used a lot of these rocks or uh, specifically the granite with the crystal in it because they knew that when you projected certain frequencies of sound into it then it would create in essence different vibrations of sound which could be used it to put one into alternate conscious states right that, that's right and uh, you know we can tell that because the the king you know what's called the king's chamber in the great pyramid 
resonates to a very specific sound, not right. just any sound, but if you hit the right note, it amplifies. Interesting. So, what about this then? Um, when, what, like, what frequency, when you just mentioned that in the King's Chamber, what frequency exactly, when you do produce it, what, um, excuse me, not frequency, but what effect is actually produced in the body to produce those alternate conscious states? Does it does it do something in your head, or is it in different chakras as the Indian systems dictate, or what kind of conscious state does it put you in, or does that vary? Um, it varies depending upon the chamber, but in the case of the, of the, of the Great Pyramid, when you, when you lie in the box, you know, the so-called sarcophagus or box, which is there, which is perfect size for a human being, and if somebody tones into the box, hitting the right frequency, the vibration goes straight through every part of, of your body, so it's a, it seems to be activating your entire body as well as your mind. Mm -hmm. And does it have any longevity properties, or does it just remedy diseases, or um, remedy, you know, what what is the, I guess, the, the benefit of the alternate consciousness? Is that, or are there many, or are there many undiscovered, or does nobody really know outside of putting you into basically an altered conscious state? Well, I don't think we have the capacity to really get into the, the higher states that uh, the original builders uh -huh. um, we're, we're able to do. Um, we, you know, we, we, you know, we get into a meditative state, um, and it's, it seems, in, in the case of the, of the King's Chamber, it seems to resonate with the actual vibration of the planet, so it's very beneficial. That's why when you put things like, you know, fruit in, in, uh, in that space or in that shape, uh, it tends not to rot. Um, people get spontaneous healing from it. Mm -hmm. So it seems to it seems to move out anything which is of, of a negative, you know, a negative nature to some degree. Mm -hmm. So when you say um, the Earth's frequency, are you referring to Schumann's frequency, the seven point eight hertz? Well, I'm not. That could very well be it, but uh, I believe it's four hundred and thirty-two. Hertz, which is the actual vibration. I think it's either A sharp or A flat, or, or oh. it wouldn't be A sharp. It'd be A flat, I believe. Okay, okay, okay. I know what you're talking about. Okay, and I want to backtrack to Baalbek, Lebanon. That stone is well over, like you mentioned, a hundred times. What, what was that part of? Was that part of a bigger structure that's yet to be surfaced or unearthed, or is that part of? Was that a single? block that was used for something specific does anybody have or you have any theories about why that block what was it used for specifically well in fact if you go to Baalbek you'll see that the original construction was never completed ah. so something 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 major interrupted its construction and so you have uh, what's called the trilithon which are three stones in a row that weigh about 1200 tons each that's 1200 wow. and then still in the quarry there are, are two stones, one which weighs about 1,200 tons and the other which weighs 1,500 tons. Mm -hmm. So uh, those, one, one of the 1,200-ton uh, stone was actually cut from the bedrock, but the 1,500-ton one is still attached to the bedrock. So obviously something interrupted whatever process was going on there. Right. It was uh, prematurely ended. <laughs> yeah. And so what about... Um, so you think that was as recent as 10,000 years ago, that structure, the Baalbek structure? Only 10,000 years, huh? Well, it's hard to tell. Uh, we would have to actually, we're going to be going back in April with um, a geologist, Susan Moore, who um, will be able to, to tell us more in terms of weathering, because this is limestone at Baalbek, which weathers quite rapidly uh -huh. relative to something like granite. So she should be able to give us some kind of indication based on the climate of the area and the amount of weathering as to how long it would have taken for the amount of erosion there. Right. Well, that's going to be that's going to be some interesting news to hear then. What about Easter Island? Um, have you ever been uh, to those monoliths there? Twice. Twice. And how, what did you uh, what do you speculate about the Easter Island statues? Well, I think they were constructed by two different cultures. The, the smaller ones 
uh, were made by the Polynesian people who arrived there maybe 2,000 years ago. But the larger ones, which have you know what are called aquiline noses, which are very non-Polynesian looking, uh, they appear to be much, much you know several thousand years older. So those, so the original ones. How old do you think those are? The original Easter Island. I think several thousand years old. But again, um, it's hard to tell. We had Dr. Robert Schock, uh, who's an American geologist, who was able to redate or date the age of the erosion of the Sphinx in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when he looked when he looked at some of these, he said, "I have no problem in believing that they could be twelve thousand plus years old." Wow! So again, back to a different geological epic period than we are currently in. Right. We're talking the difference between, or we're talking the time period of the end of the last ice age. Wow. So again, uh, no no theories on who constructed those. Just a different subspecies of the human, possibly the Nephilim or somebody else. Well, it could be because um, Easter Island has a very special kind of writing called Rongo Rongo, mm -hmm. and uh, no no other Polynesian culture had that. Uh -huh. And since since it's thought by most archaeologists that um, Easter Island was you know the last place that the Polynesians um, found, <clears throat> and all of a sudden you have this you know complex obscure writing, it's more likely that that uh, written script comes from a much older culture and the one that they found which is somewhat related to it is in the Indus Valley and the Indian subcontinent so it could be that the original people came from some part of the Middle East or India. Huh, interesting. And what about, I asked you this question in the beginning but I kind of want to reiterate it. What about in your research in your opinion, what are some of the most profound megalithic structures you've seen, you've discovered, or, or researched yourself? Well, again, uh, the Great Pyramids in Egypt, Baalbek in Lebanon, the Serapium, which is in Egypt, which is a, a tunnel with these hundred-ton boxes. Wow. Uh, and then in, then in Peru, Machu Picchu, actually, the core of Machu Picchu is megalithic. It was not built by the Inca. Uh, then there's a site called Oyente Tambo, um, which again has a megalithic element and was later occupied by the Inca, as well as Sacsayhuaman, which is where we find 125 ton uh, stone, uh, stones that make up this massive wall. And then in Bolivia, it would be Tiwanaku and Puma Punku. Hmm. Get, um, go into the uh, Saipian one in the Egypt, like you mentioned, with the 100 ton blocks. Um... Because I'm not too familiar with that. That sounded interesting. Yeah, it's um, it's a site that's only been reopened for the last, I think, two and a half years. It's located at a major site called Saqqara. And so you go down this ramp and you enter this tunnel. And inside, there are actually, it's a system of, tu of, of tunnels. And there are, I believe, 100, or not, not 125, there are 25 boxes, um, as in stone box with a lid, that uh, each one of those boxes with the lid weighed 100 tons. Wow. And how did they how did they manage to do 100 ton blocks and tunnels like that? Any theories on that? Well, the dynastic Egyptians could not have, have done that work because even even modern engineers um, who look at these boxes, you know, the, the box itself is made of one piece and it's usually granite, granodiorite, or even diorite, which are profoundly hard stones. Um, so even modern, modern engineers don't know how we today could, could make something like that. They don't know what tools we have in the 21st century to be able to create precision on that level. Right, and not to mention get it underground and then set it perfectly on the sarcophagus. And, and also move the stone from Aswan, which would be 500 miles away, or from Central Africa, which is where we believe the stone came from. Did they ever, um, when when excavating the sarcophagus, did they ever, what did they discover? Was it just regular humans or nothing? Or what did they discover when they went in there originally? Or did they not say? Uh, in the, like, I believe it was rediscovered in the 19th century. Um, and unfortunately, the archaeologist at the time uh, thought that the boxes themselves can, would have contained um, gold and silver and jewels and things. And since they couldn't actually move the lids off the boxes, they decided to blow them up. 
<laughs> and so mo most of them are very heavily damaged. And when they did blow them up, they found out there was nothing inside. Oh, wow. So there was nothing in it already back then. Right. Huh. That's interesting. Makes you wonder if there was ever anything in there. Maybe they used it just as resonant capacitors, or what do you think? Yeah, I, I think they were definitely used as some kind of uh, resonance boxes um, or capacitors of, of some kind. Uh, there, there is carving or hieroglyphics on the outside of some of them, but the crudeness of, of the hieroglyphics is very, very poor as compared to the manufacturing of the boxes. So obviously the dynastic Egyptians found these boxes and decided to attempt to make them sarcophaguses by you know, by carving, by etching in hieroglyphics on them. Right, maybe after the fact, right? Very much after the fact. Right. And what about the Paracas people of, of South America, like we spoke about last time? Do you think, uh, do these people have anything to do with the construction of these megalithic structures, any of them? Or do you think that they, again, came in way after the fact? Uh, the Paracas themselves came way after the fact, but... I think, uh, I think elongated skull people have existed in Peru and Bolivia for multiple thousands of years. Uh, we haven't found any of their graves or tombs yet, but it, it could be since the, you know, they lived so far back in time. Mm -hmm. And the climate, at least in the highlands or where Tiwanaku and Cusco are, are very wet, that any human remains would be completely gone by now. Right. Very interesting. So, what, which, which uh, megalithic structure are you currently researching? Which one of them is your most favorite or of interest as of right now? Uh, I can't really think of one over the top of my head. What I did, uh, you know, what I do know is that where the any place the Inca were, you know, they existed from about one thousand to fifteen hundred A.D. They always constructed their buildings and temples and things at megalithic locations. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we find, you know, that's why we'll find a section of a megalithic wall at Oyente Tambo, etc. And yesterday I was looking up uh, photographs of a site in um, Ecuador called Inga Perca. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, there I actually uh, was able to find remnants of megalithic construction. So clearly these megalithic builders went as far north as Ecuador. That's amazing. Now, what about, um, you mentioned that they built them on specific locations, which I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the ley lines in our Earth, or the geographic ley lines. Is, you, is that what you're referring to when they, when you say they built them in specific locations? Yeah, that's the amazing thing, is that they're all basically found along one line that goes from the northwest to the southeast. And in the oral tradition, that line is called the Path of Viracocha, and uh, three years ago, we had a group of dowsers of international reputation, not just like, you know, flakes. These are real, serious people. They spent 12 days with us, and we, we traveled the path of Viracocha, and they mapped the, uh, the energy system that is still uh, existing to this very day. And what is that energy system? Can you go into a little bit of detail about that? It's basically the, the Earth... Um, has its own natural energy grid system. Uh, it's just it's you know it's part of what what the planet does because it has a metallic core you know and it's spinning etc. So these light energies you know do exist. They are a natural function of, of what the, what the Earth does. So if you set up a megalithic structure along that line that has quartz crystal in it, then any energy that passes through there is amplified at that site. So that's that's kind of the benefit to building that is basically the amplification again of the of the sound or the the energy running through there. That's right. Amazing. Okay, sounds good. Anything else? Um, anything else noteworthy of sharing with uh, in regards to megalithic structures? Well, we're going to uh, Mexico in about a week, and we're going to ex ex be exploring the Aztec, Toltec, Olmec, and Maya sites, and I believe that at some of the Olmec sites we're going to find some megalithic work. I've, I ha, I've been to Mexico many times, but not to Olmec country. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're the oldest They're the oldest of the cultures, and they had elongated heads. So mm -hmm. I'm going to see if, um, if I can find some megalithic remains in that part of uh, Mexico. 
Very nice. Well, if you do, then um, then I'm sure you'll share it with everyone, right? Sure. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, sounds good, Brian. Um, so I just wanted to touch up on that and do a brief interview. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention or anything else you want to throw out there? Any tours coming up, new books, any series? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm working on a book right now about the path of Viracocha. Nice. Um, and then in April, we're going to be in Egypt for two weeks. And um, if people want to look at my website, hiddenincatours.com, Okay. You can see that we still we still have space on that tour. The, the Mexico one's full. Uh, then we have a major tour of Peru and Bolivia in July, and that one's full. But um, if people want to learn more more about me, everything is at hiddenincatours.com, including links to 800 of my videos, you know, articles. This interview will go up there, etc. Absolutely, and I'll make sure to put all the links and descriptions and everything in this um, in the YouTube section. So if people didn't get that what you just said, then they can check out the links and they can definitely contact you and the tours that you're doing and all the upcoming books and all that stuff. Okay, great. Okay, sounds good, Brian. So um, good interview, and we will chat soon again. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.